Hello students, how are you? I hope you are all right. Today we are going to deal with the evolution of democracy in France. We have already talked and studied the evolution of democracy in Great Britain. Well, this is completely different from the one in Great Britain. You will see that there were revolutions, um, kings were overthrown, and people rioted in order to obtain rights. Before starting with history, it is important to take into account the present reality of the government in France. This is the um, governmental system in France nowadays at present. It is a semi-presidential uh, government because the president has to govern with the prime minister and the cabinet system. There is also a parliament with the National Assembly. Remember that the National Assembly was born with uh, the first stage of the French Revolution. Then it was uh, changed to the National Convention, but it came back to the National Assembly, which nowadays exists in uh, France. There is a Senate and a Constitutional Council uh, whose function is to revise constitution because from 1789 up to now, uh, there were approximately 20 constitutions in France. Well, this is the Fifth Republic. We are going to study the Second and the Third Republic. The Fourth, well, came after 1875, and then uh, came the Fifth Republic, which nowadays is the one uh, which rules France. Uh, the Senate is composed of all deputies, councillors, and the delegates of the municipal councils. And if you take a look at the bottom of the screen, all citizens are voters. That is to say that all of them are allowed to vote. No restrictions in enfranchisement. But how did it all begin in France? You have two pictures there. At the top left, Napoleon, Louis Napoleon Bonaparte, yeah, another Napoleon Bonaparte. And uh, on the bottom right, the current and the present president of the France, that is to say, Francois Macron. And were there more revolutions in France? Okay, what do you think? Let's see. We are going to start with the July Revolution in Fran in English, sorry, and the Revolution de Julia in French. What was this revolution? Well, it happened in 1830 in France when uh, the king was Charles X. If you stop to think, you will remember that Napoleon was defeated in 1815 and uh, uh, the Congress of Vienna was also held that year and one of the principles of the Congress of Vienna was uh, the principle of legitimacy. Remember that all the monarchies were restored and one of the monarchies uh, which was restored was the Bourbon dynasty and the king was Charles X at the time of this revolution. Fifteen years had ha uh, elapsed from the last revolution or the last defeat of Napoleon and in France we have another revolution. Charles X was totally unpopular because he was a despot and he favored aristocracy so he had to abdicate. When he abdicated he did it uh, to his grandson who was just 10 years old and France had a king for just 20 minutes, yeah. He was the king for 20 minutes until Louis Philippe, who was also uh, Charles X's grandson, took the power and became the king of France. So, what happened with Louis Philippe? So, remember, the Revolution de Juliet had the main objective of, of overthrowing Charles X, and they fulfilled the, the, that uh, objective because Charles, the Charles X was overthrown and Louis Philippe became the king of France. This is Louis Philippe at the moment, or Louis Philippe at the moment of his uh, uh, position of the king of France. 
Well, what about Louis Philippe as a ruler, as a governor, or as a king of France? First of all, uh, we have to say that France made little progress toward democratic government until 1817. So, 1817 with the beginning of the Third Republic. So, we are going to come back in time with Louis Philippe. The government of Louis Philippe, which was set up after the July Revolution, remember, was a considerable improvement over that of his predecessor, Charles X. But, of course, it was still far from representing the rule of the masses. Masses were ignored by Louis Philippe, who favored the bourgeoisie and systematically ignore the lower classes. So, although enfranchisement, uh, remember the meaning of enfranchisement, as we say in Spanish, los, la gente que tiene la capacidad para votar, en los padrones, enfranchisement, uh, the conditions were enlarged, but only 200,000 people were allowed to vote in France. And when the leaders of the masses went to talk to the king, the king didn't talk to them and sent an official. That official was Guzot, uh, who was one of the main um, principals of uh, Guizot, that was the name of the king. And when the, the, the leaders talked to Guizot for the liberalization of the franchise, he said, get rich. If you get rich, you will be able to vote. So, imagine the government of Louis Philippe also favored aristocracy, the bourgeoisie, and not the masses. So, people believed that another revolution uh, was needed. So, the revolution of 1848 is called the February Revolution. The July Revolution of 1830 had as a main objective to overthrow Charles X. This revolution had as a main objective to overthrow Louis Philippe. The causes of this February Revolution of 1848 were several, but let's analyze one by one. The first one was the demand for democracy. People were fed up with the authoritative government of the kings, with the absolute government of uh, Charles X I and Louis Philippe in the second uh, place. So they wanted democracy, and that is why they were ready for the, de the, for the revolution. Another important cause was the disgust with the corruption of Louis Philippe and his intimate circle. So, Louis Philippe believed he was uh, Louis the 16th or the 15th and had a luxurious life and obviously uh, benefited the nobility and corruption was very common in his circle. So, people were fed up with the corruption of the king and the circle. Another important cause was the discontent of the Catholics. Well, yeah. Catholicism was the official religion in France at that moment, and what happened with the Catholic? Well, this third cause was discontent of Catholic with the uh, apparent anti-clerical um, policy of the king, Louis Philippe, who was also known as the citizen king. He appointed his chief minister, and the chief minister, Guizot, remember that, he was the one who told the masses, get rich to vote, Guizot, yeah, uh, he was the chief minister, and he was Protestant. So that is why the Catholics were really dis uh, unhappy with this situation, and this discontent of the Catholics can also be considered as one of the causes of the February Revolution. And the spread of socialism, remember, socialism... Uh, we talked about Karl Marx, and uh, well, the proletariat, uh, the industrial workers were fed up with being overworked and being underpaid. So, this full cause, the spread of socialism through the ranks of industrial proletariat. During uh, 
the, the months preceding this revolution, obviously, workers had been converted, most of them, into socialism. So, um, people believed that it was necessary a revolution to change everything. This uh, is one of the images of the starting point of the 1848 revolution in France, or the February Revolution. Well, what happened with the king? Uh, the February Revolution, remember, had as a main objective to overthrow the king. The February Revolution was a product also of nationalism, because Louis Philippe was considered the king of the bourgeoisie, and he had placed business above everything else. So he, was, he wanted to avoid war at all costs, and this angered patriotic Frenchmen who dreamt of national glory, the national glory uh, for the restoration of France to a position of leadership among the powers of Europe. So everything was organized for a demonstration. The most defiant opposition came from these patriotic republicans who wanted to change everything. So in 1847, um, the main group of Republican, Republicans sorry, organized a campaign of monster demonstrations and uh, political banquets designed to impress upon the king the need to reform. When the government took alarm and prohibited th this demonstration of February 22nd, 1848, Barricade, barricades sorry, were thrown up in the streets, and two days later, Louis Philippe was forced to abdicate. Louis Philippe was forced to abdicate. So one more king who was forced to abdicate. In 1830, it was Charles X. Well, in February 1848, the one who had to abdicate was Louis Philippe, the new king. So a provisional government of republicans uh, and socialists took over control of the state. And it was decided in April that elections were held for a constitute assembly. So for the one of this happened before, but after Napoleon Bonaparte, this is the first time that elections appeared again in the history of France with this constituted assembly. So uh, the constituted assembly had to complete a constitution to establish the second republic. Okay, so there was a constitution that the national assembly drafted and it had this point. There had to be a president uh, whose term was a four-year term. So the president has this term, four years. Also, uh, this uh, constitution for the Second Republic talked about the famous separation of powers. The document, uh, this document was partly a copy of the Constitution of the United States. Uh, it also contained, besides the president and the separation of powers, universal manhood suffrage. So there were no restrictions or restrictions were uh, a lesson for people to have the right to cast a vote in national elections and also a bill of rights in order to provide uh, citizens for the rights of life, property that did not exist at the time of Charles X or Louis Philippe. So, elections in France. What happened with the elections? There were four candidates. Four candidates competed in this election. A moderate Republican, a Socialist, a Catholic, and a man who had something for everybody. Do you imagine who was that man? Well, that man was Louis Napoleon Bonaparte. Yes, one more time we talk of a Napoleon Bonaparte in France. Uh, more than 7 million people, well, this 
you can see here in this picture the different candidates and clearly you can see there Louis Napoleon Bonaparte. Well, uh, Louis Napoleon Bonaparte, yeah, who was very popular, obtained 5.5 million of 7 million votes in France. So, approximately 80% of the people voted for Louis Napoleon Bonaparte to be the president of France. But who was this man? Why did he enjoy such amazing popularity that allowed him to uh, obtain uh, such a huge majority, twice as many votes as the other three candidates combined? Well, Louis Napoleon Bonaparte was the nephew of Napoleon I, so the famous Napoleon Bonaparte, the original, and his father was Louis Bonaparte, who for a brief period was a king of Holland. After his uncle's downfall, Louis Napoleon went to exile, spending most of his time in Germany, then in Switzerland, then he came back to France after the July Revolution of 1830, then he was expelled, he was, uh, he was sent to Great Britain, and there he uh, was patronized by some liberal uh, British and also French. So, when um, he became the president of France as his uh, uncle, he was not happy. He was not uh, long content to be merely the president of France, so he organized a plebiscite. A plebiscite is a kind of election in which people had to vote for yes or no. For example, in Argentina, the last plebiscite was um, organized in uh, 1980. We had to vote if we wanted to go to war against Chile because of the Beagle Channel or not. And people obviously, with the intervention of the Pope, voted for no. N uh, we didn't want war against Chile and Chile uh, robbed and stole the, the Beagle Channel for themselves. Well, uh, coming back to France, this place besides was organized with the intention of uh, imposing a kind of uh, dictatorship uh, with the leadership, of course, of Louis Napoleon Bonaparte. In 1851, uh, the great opportunity for Louis Napoleon came to strike again a blow at the Republic. He wanted to wipe out the Republic. What happened? The assembly, which was dominated by the bourgeoisie, again imposed restriction to universal manhood suffrage. So Napoleon perceived his chance uh, to be the defender of the right of the masses, and when the legislators refused to change what Napoleon uh, ordered, he dissolved the assembly proclaimed a temporary dictatorship and invited the people to grant him the power to draw up a new constitution. Okay, so uh, in this place beside, which was organized in 1851, he was authorized by 90% of the French, 90% of the French, 7.5 million votes against 640,000 votes, he won with that majority to proceed as he liked. So he could do whatever he liked. The French gave him all the possibilities to do what he liked. So the new constitution, which he put into effect in January 1851, made the president, that is to say Louis Napoleon Bonaparte, uh, a a real dictator. His term of office was uh, enlarged to 10 years. Remember that it was just four years, well, to 10 years, and he was given the exclusive power to initiate legislation, that is to say, to make laws and to uh, declare war or to make peace. So he dissolved the assembly, no more the republic, and he came back to be a dictator in France. But he was not happy with that. 
he organized a new plebiscite in which he asked the French if they wanted him to become an emperor. So, after exactly one year, uh, that is to say 1852, Louis Napoleon Bonaparte ordered this place beside, and with the 95% of the vote, he assumed the title of Napoleon III, Emperor of the French. So, we have one more time another Louis Napoleon, Emperor of the French. What was his government as an emperor? Well, the second empire, the first was Napoleon I, Napoleon Bonaparte. The second lasted uh, 18 years from 1852 to 1850. That is the second empire in France. He stimulated, stimulated an imposing prosperity as Napoleon because uh, he drained swamps, he built roads, improved harbors, uh, he subsidized railroads, um, he constructed magnificent system of boulevards in Paris, and he always cultivated uh, words or famous phrases for the lower class classes so they could be satisfied with what he said, but he didn't do what he said. So, Louis Napoleon Bonaparte. Um, his aggressive foreign policy was similar to the one uh, his uncle had in the first empire. Obviously, he was not as intelligent as his uncle and made huge mistakes. Uh, for example, he went to Africa uh, where he annexed Algeria in northern Africa. He helped the Italians to get rid of the Austrians. He intervened in the independence war in Mexico and he also went to Asia, yes, because he plunged into the Crimean War as war with Russia under the protect uh, under the pretext sorry of protecting Catholic monks in Turkey. And also uh, he established a protectorate over Indochina. So remember he intervened in Italy helping between inverted commas the Italians to get rid of the Austrians. He intervened in the independence war in Mexico. He went to Africa. He established a protectorate in Indochina and he also uh, participated in the what was the end for him, the Franco-Prussian war against Francia and against Otto von Bismarck. And also he intervened with Great Britain uh, in the uh, a, a war against Russia, which was the Crimean War. So he had a foreign policy, aggressive foreign policy that finally uh, was, that is to say, the final blow for Louis Napoleon Bonaparte as an emperor. All these um, costly wars cost 75,000 deaths in France of soldiers. So his reputation had begun to wear thin. That is to say, he was not as popular as he was to be, as he used to be, sorry, when he won the famous plebiscites. Okay? So his defeat in the Franco Prussian War was vital. The war was declared by Napoleon, yes, by Louis Napoleon Bonaparte to Prussia, to Otto von Bismarck and to William I or Wilhelm I that we are going to study in our next class. So when Prussia defeated France, Prussia took Alsace and Lorraine. And when France took, and when Germany or Prussia, sorry, took Alsace and Lorraine, well, it was the emergence as well of Germany as a great power in the Industrial Revolution, and it was a final blow for the growth uh, of France as an industrial country. So, uh, when he lost the Franco-Prussian War, when he was defeated by Otto von Bismarck, he was taken prisoner and two days after being taken prisoner, his government was overthrown. Yes, the government of uh, Napoleon Bonaparte, Louis Napoleon, was overthrown in 1870. And 
it was then that finally a republic was established in France. Finally. That was the last monarchy France had. So the end of the Second Republic was the final blow for the monarchy in France. France after Louis Napoleon. Well, uh, a provisional government was set up. The president was Louis Jules Trachet, just for four months. Then um, there were elections, but this time nobody wanted to be the dictator of uh, France. And in 1875, as I told you at the beginning of this presentation, uh, the Third Republic of France was established. And the first uh, democratic features uh, remained then with the Fourth Republic and with the Fifth Republic, the picture I showed you at the beginning of the presentation. Democratic features, universal manhood suffrage, uh, legislative body, the parliament, the cabinet system, and the prime minister are the main features of democracy of France. Remember that France is a semi-presidential country because the president, Macron, has to rule uh, together with the prime minister. Well, it was a long class, but uh, France was complicated with so many revolutions. Yeah, remember the July Revolution, the February Revolution, Charles X and Louis Philippe. And then finally, in 1875, the democracy was established, the one that the French enjoyed nowadays. Thank you very much for your support. Bye-bye.